Welcome to Natural Resources University. This week's episode features Deer University, hosted by Bronson Strickland and Steve Damaris. Welcome to Deer University, the podcast of the Mississippi State University Deer Lab. I'm Bronson Strickland. And I'm Steve Damaris. We're both lifelong hunters, deer biologists, professors of wildlife management, and co-directors of the MSU Deer Lab. We explain the latest research, including our own work and that conducted elsewhere. So if you're interested in deer biology and management, this is your podcast. Every decision you make is a step in your management program, and we give you the knowledge to make every decision count. Welcome back, everyone, to the Deer University podcast. This is Bronson Strickland, and I am delighted to be joined uh, by my friend and colleague and sometimes mentor, sometimes not, <laughs> Steve Damaris. Steve, how are you? Great, Bronson. It's always wonderful to, to work with you and, and uh, for you and around you and just try to keep up. <laughs> yeah, try right. to keep up. So, this, Steve... This is, this is a uh, fun... It, well, I'm sorry, I'm jumping in, but this is just a fun, this is just a fun podcast for us. I, I hope it is. It should be. It should be a lot of fun. And uh, so we did a request. We actually did some finger pointing, if I remember correctly, with the little Instagram post that was made about asking questions. And uh, our graduate student, Luke, really wanted us to squint and scowl and point and cajole <laughs> and I, I think you did you did more of the squinting and sc- scowling than i did well you know anybody that follows our social media you're familiar with luke resop mm-hmm. i mean he's, he's motivational and enthusiastic cap- highly capable all those things and and we give him a simple thing hey let's let's put out a request for questions i mean he he doesn't just put out requests for questions. He yeah. tasked us with a. Uh, he <laughs> comes around. Hey, let, let me take your picture. And I was out in the parking lot, and he says, uh, "I really want to give you. I want you to give me some attitude, like the old. <laughs> uh, I want you for savings bonds and whatever." Mm-hmm. And and I gave him some attitude. Yeah. I took direction. Direct. My director said, "Give me some attitude." And he took my picture, and I said, so, so how's it look? And he said, oh, great, great. And he's, he's just walking away from me, won't let me look at it. And, and lo and behold, it was... Uh, it had attitude. It had attitude in it. Yeah. Now, yours was a little happy face. I mean, you, you I, got I a, little a little ha- friendly. little happy face, like, hey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I wasn't telling people to, to give us questions. I was asking them. I was yes. asking them politely. Yes, you, and, you and that yelling. kind of maybe goes back to our personality differences you're you're the nice guy and i'm the the other guy can be not so nice sometimes if we were police officers partners you'd be the good cop cop all the time i'd be the bad (laughs) cop all the time well steve we we got a a bunch of questions uh we, we have so many that we're gonna have to break this up into at least two episodes and maybe three so um what we decided to do we would kind of theme this episode of all the questions that were related more to deer biology and behavior and buck movements and then some of the relationships with hunting that that go along with that so i guess there's no better time than the present we will just jump right in so i will start with matt matt's question i don't see in here where he's from But essentially, and people who wrote the questions, forgive me, I'm I'm trying to condense down. Uh, Some people wrote a paragraph or two, so I'm I'm just trying to reduce it down to to the actual question. But essentially, Matt is wanting to know about all things scrapes and rubs. So Steve, why don't you give us just a a little bit of a review. I I know you have... uh, you have a thought on how to handle this in terms of doing an entire episode related to it, but why, why don't until, until we get that episode done, why don't we just start with a little review of what scrapes and rubs are? Okay. Well, scrapes and rubs are, are basically social media 
outreach by individual deer during prior to the breeding season leading up to it and through the breeding season and they're telling others within their population what's going on with them and uh there's different you know i don't want to get into details about which scrape what's a scrape versus a rub and and all that uh, because uh you know his question here was hey can y'all do a podcast on all things scrapes and rubs and i think that's great that's a because it's a huge complex question and and we've just wrapped up a year-long project in in north mississippi and south tennessee where we were uh, documenting scrape behavior and uh, we had 104 scrapes that we were monitoring from october through january and we just have this massive database now that uh, i don't think anybody's ever published at least on on this level of uh, analysis of scraping behavior and the number of social interactions and the number of bucks visiting individual scrapes i think it's just like wow let's let's just do a whole podcast like like matt (laughs) asked for and we're going to give it to you matt We, we might need a little time to to delve into that 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 it's a lot of data a lot of photos and so um our former student and now colleague miranda she is she is going through that right now and that number of photos can be overwhelming so it's going to take some time to parse that apart and um so bear with us but we promise we will do an entire episode related to that topic and just a little a little bit of teaser you know we think of well bucks bucks visit do the scraping and does will check out the scrapes when they're in esters yeah most of the visitations and the activities associated with the scrape were the bucks but does were right up there in terms of a significant number of does were visiting the scrapes and not just when they were in estrus Mm -hmm. Uh, now we didn't have uniquely identified does so it's hard to say how many times and and how frequently in the space of visitation Uh, but given the the width of time the does were visiting it's more than just you know during her estrus period and we even had fawns visiting Mm-hmm. And, and you know, the, the, the does and the fawns, their most interest was focused on the licking branch, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, you know, the bucks are all about licking branch. They're all about peeing on themselves and rubbing their legs together and pawing the ground. The does and the fawns, they, they were just kind of, hey, that, that licking branch smells pretty interesting. Let me, let me stick my nose up there. Yeah. So we were joking around the other day, we were thinking about some potential titles for this research, and I, w- I was calling a, a scrape as kind of like deer graffiti. And yeah. Kind of thinking back when you're going through, you know, w- w- whatever town, and you'll see the, whatever the name is, was here, Tom was here, Jack was here, whatever. That That's kind of part of the, the signpost communication of, of these bucks and deer is they are leaving a chemical signal saying I was here and then other people, other not other people, other deer are coming along and being able to see who was here. And then of course there's a lot more sophisticated pheromonal communication going on and potentially estrus status and not only who was here, when they were here and we'll, we'll delve into all of that in the entire episode. But a lot of information, interesting information there with with scrapes and rubs yeah and we didn't even worry about rubs well Mm -hmm. maybe we should do that this year monitor some rubs with the cameras hey man if you got the time i got the cameras (laughs) we'll we'll, (laughs) we'll work on that work on that so our our next uh, person here and these are not chronologically listed or whatever we just grouped them by uh, category. So Stryker from uh, who hunts the western part of South Carolina. And, and he's talking about, um, you know, seeing the buck doe ratio and the age classes of bucks. And uh, he said, I've noticed this year, especially, which I guess was this past year, uh, or maybe he's talking about this, this summer and early fall, this year, especially, there have been a lot of fawns born later in the year than normal. And he says, our hunt in the area, our rut in the area where I hunt is heaviest around the last two weeks of November. And uh, so I want to kind of 
there's several questions and comments in here. I want to kind of break it out, and I want to say some things about that. Our rut, uh, our fawning period was later this year than normal. And I'm going to try not to, uh, I, I tend to be nitpicky and, and uh, delve into details. And one of the things I, I like to try to talk about when we're talking about breeding dates is they don't change from year to year. A population breeding date is relatively stable. There's going to be some variation within the population as to when individual does breed, but the average breeding date, and then there's usually a range of breeding dates of about 40, you know, I like to say three weeks before the peak of breeding and three weeks after the peak of breeding, that 48 days or, you know, 45 day period there, that's most of the breeding is going to take place during that period. And there's going to be this peak is going to be the peak from year to year to year, unless there's some huge change in population age structure, uh, major changes in habitat quality, thus the nutrition. It, it's pretty stable from year to year. So the fact, um, Stryker, your, your observation that you're seeing uh, later fawning, I, my personal opinion there. And I don't want to say you're wrong, but my personal experience and knowledge about breeding dates is this year isn't necessarily a two week later fawning period. I think what you're probably seeing is, well, it's, it's what you're seeing and, and hunters and, and landowners and those in outdoor enthusiasts, we go out and we see stuff, but the amount, the sample size that we see is so small relative to the population that's out there and we might see and stumble upon a few here and there hits and misses and one year we see a few things and then the next year we see a few things and a few things on any given year is going to be a, a not representative of what the whole population is doing so my my take on this striker is that uh, there wasn't a two-week shift in in fawning dates and thus breeding dates that uh, you probably just saw some things this year that based on the number of things you saw would indicate a change to you but if you saw enough things about really what's happening in the population there wasn't a major shift in breeding dates and fawning dates and steve let me add on there just to <clears throat> let, let people know because a lot of times when biologists are asked this and you'll see it in articles we've written and, and other people with similar articles we're we're pretty dogmatic we're we're pretty secure in our our viewpoint that the rut is not moving around two or three weeks up or back year in and year out and this typically comes uh through the moon discussions every year a particular moon and the rut's going to be earlier or later and the, the one reason we say this with such confidence is that year in and year out when you sample does and this has been done in mississippi just thousands and thousands of records we can show this and in other states as well is that when we're able to, to harvest does in the springtime and then you can examine the size of the fetus uh, Joe Hamilton's scale he developed many many years ago and we verified it with uh, known breeding here in our deer pens deer from different regions we verified that relationship and that relationship was really really strong is that that we know essentially to the day or two there could be a little variation there but we know to the day or two when that doe was bred and conceived and when you look at at a particular site year after year after year after year on and on and on there is very little if any change in the mean conception date the average conception date on these properties mm -hmm. and that's just not here that's in every state wildlife agency that's done this you see the same thing over and over and like you mentioned there of course there can always be an exception but I would say it's uh, it would be a more of a, a catastrophic event 
would cause mm-hmm. there to be a shift. I mean, just some huge environmental disaster like a flood or some change in habitat that really changed the physiological condition of the deer, something like that. But um, you're just never going to see a swing of two to three weeks in the peak of the rut on a property from year to mm-hmm. year. So that's kind of the reason we say that with such conviction. So we, we just yeah, have so much you, data showing it. Back to the sample size thing. If, if, if you see three or four animals out of a population, that those three or four could very easily have just be oddballs. But when you see 50 or 60 or 70 animals, like the kind of sample sizes we're talking, 150 samples from a population, it, there's a distinct, consistent peak. Yeah. Now, a couple of, uh, well, we, I mean, we just do a whole podcast just on this topic. A uh, couple of early research projects back 30, 40 years ago, uh, Dave Gwindet uh, led a project in, in, uh, in the East Coast. Uh, he was out of Clemson at the time. And uh, they looked at uh, a major shift in age and sex ratio and going from you know, shooting any buck and just having a really young buck age structure versus and an unbalanced sex ratio to a more balanced older bucks and a balanced sex ratio. I think they documented about a 30 day shift in, in breeding dates. That was a major management population management change that led to that. And then some work I did with, with colleagues in, in central Texas, Bob Cook and Gene Fox and others where they had a, a terribly managed property that was purchased and then managed very effectively major habitat improvements, major changes in, in grazing pressure of domestic livestock, basically took all the domestic livestock off, uh, clearing brush, prescribed burning, uh, and a huge population reduction in the deer, in the white-tailed deer population as well as a bunch of exotics getting those off the property they had a we documented a 45 day shift in breeding and a huge uh, concentration of breeding instead of breeding spread out over three months we had that back down to 45 day ideal breeding dates and a 45 day shift earlier so the, the deer were in much better shape they were you know, more consistently breeding when they should be breeding, not when they just happen to survive a long enough and be in good enough shape to breed. So, yes, you can shift breeding dates, but it takes a huge impact. Large-scale population, large-scale habitat, large-scale nutritional impacts can shift breeding dates. But the average place doesn't change much from year to year. You're you, not you see rarely see that change. big of a swing from, from yeah. year to year. And, and so what, what y'all did was through all of the management, population management, habitat management, et cetera, is you allowed the does to be in good physiological condition at the time they were genetically programmed to come into heat. Yes. So they didn't have to wait for their body condition to catch up. It was basically their insufficient physiological condition because of the management. And then when the their genes and the hormonal processes told them it's time to come into heat, they came into heat. Absolutely. Hence the pig of the rut. Absolutely. Yeah. And then related to uh, Heck, follow-up Steve, question. That, that's just the first part of that question. Yeah. Yeah. It's great <laughs> stuff, Striker. Thank you for bringing all this stuff up. So next part was with fawns being born in July and August, will that affect when that particular doe will come into estrus again? And this brings up um, Mike Dye's work that uh, we supervised him in in our deer research facility. And and uh, we pulled together a database from Mississippi State Deer Research Facility, and we we looked at uh, breeding records from the Kerr Wildlife Management Area. We we even got some from the University of Georgia, Mm -hmm. University of um, Carl Miller. And so we really looked at all these year to year known does, when did they fawn, uh, and, and looked at consistency and patterns. And we, and you're, you're always nice enough to point out that I'm still learning things. 
And because I had this perception based on my experiences with individual deer in breeding pens that I was aware of. And I had this conception that, you know, a doe is going to year in, year out, going to breed plus or minus a few days, year in, year out, same, Mm -hmm. same time. Because of some deer that I remembered that happened to have that pattern. And, and you know, go, go ahead and expound on that problem with people that, like me, that have a, a perception. You remembered the exception and not the rule. So you remembered a very few memorable instances mm-hmm. where it conformed to your thinking, yeah. to, to the rule you had made. Yep. And and we're all guilty of that. Every and, human being is guilty of it. Yes. And that ties back to the whole sample size thing. I had this perception of individual does that I remembered. Well, you know, so-and-so was always on the, you know, July 6th, 7th, 8th. She fawned every year. And yes, she did. But when, when Mike gathered all this data from our research pens and, and Kerr and, and Georgia, uh, you remember what they learned, what he learned? I remember it was a, so we would call that uh, interannual variability or interannual repeatability, but th- there was a lot more wiggle room from year to year within an individual mm-hmm. over time, year after year yeah. after year. And, and Steve, I don't remember the exact number, but I do want to say it was like plus or minus eight or nine or 10 days and not mm-hmm. plus or minus one or two days. Yeah. So there, there could be a couple weeks swing for an individual, but then when you've still plotted the, the population average, the peak for the population was consistent yeah. from year to year. Yep. And we looked at, and tying back to the whole nutritional availability and, and, you know, how that nutritional impact can affect animals. You know, we did document that, uh, the, time in which or the duration of lactation and the number of fawns does that brought fawns through full natural weaning tended to delay their breeding by about five days versus does that lost their fawns and and didn't have that uh, nutritional demand from and stress from lactation and then these are research pens where Full ration pellets are available in all the three facilities we use, but still that demand of lactation, even though there's good food around, if the fawns were weaned naturally or, you know, went basically three, three to three and a half months of of nursing, those does took a little while to recover and tended in that year, breed a little bit later. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, five days on average compared to those that lost their fawns early. So there is variation. Yeah, there is variation. But but it's at the individual scale, not the population yes, scale. Not the population. And and we uh, we all have to be careful uh, about, and, and Stryker, you know, you now realize I've done the same thing that I was kind of fussing <laughs> at you about earlier. You, you see a few things. And those are what you remember. And, and I did the same thing with, based on my earlier experiences with individual deer that I'd been associated with in our, in our research facility. So, um, thank you for admitting it, Steve. Yes. I, I'm, if nothing else, I'm as critical on about myself as I am on others. Mm-hmm. Okay. So did that, um, did that wrap that question up, Steve? I think so. I think okay. so. And Stryker gave us a, he said, any information would be awesome. We've just given you a bunch of information. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Steve. Next question is from Chuck Cole, uh, Tate County. I'm going to assume Tate County, Mississippi. Um, is there a, paraphrasing here, is there a type of rack, the dimensions of it, that are going to make a buck more dominant? than say bucks that are lo- lower tiered so if a buck for example he says if, if a buck is a short tined eight pointer um and he's the primary buck is that going to make him more dominant or less dominant 
And that kind of ties back to some quite a ways back research uh, led by Randy DeYoung, our, our doctoral student here. And um, he looked at breeding success of bucks in our research pens in mixes of different ages of bucks. And now we, in those, in the research pens, we cut the antlers off. So they just had, you know, one inch stubs on both sides. So the, we looked at uh, age and body mass and which uh, better explained breeding success. And Randy's data analysis showed that 50% of the breeding success was explained by body mass and age wasn't that big of a deal. And well, they're so, so highly you know, correlated. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's yeah. yeah. So the main driver and analytically yeah. was the body mass, not necessarily the age. So Randy's analysis showing that 50% of the breeding success was related to body mass, which t- is tied to age. But to me, the other 50% that it didn't explain age and body mass didn't explain 50% of the, the breeding success. And to me, that speaks a lot to something that we didn't, weren't able to document in that study was attitude. Yeah. How I, aggressive I that, they are. Yeah. The aggressiveness of an individual buck, their personality. Um, some but bucks Steve, are just going to be more aggressive than others. Right, right, right. Uh, coupled with that, it's what's kind of cool is we looked at this a lot of different ways over the years, and I'm remembering familiar with the, the research Randy did. Um, but Phil Jones also led a kind of a follow-up study we did a number of years later and found the exact same thing, that the, the number one determinant was, was body weight. But the, the revealing thing with that study was that it changed over the duration of the rut. So from the beginning to the end, and so you think about just what you said, is those ones that were really successful, they're, they're older, they're bigger, they're more aggressive, they also give out a gas. The, you know, that, that, that aggression eventually starts taking its toll on them at a greater rate than does an equivalently sized buck but he may have a more laid back attitude. And mm-hmm. so you would see the bigger aggressive bucks were more successful earlier, but some of those that kind of laid back and, you know, I'm not going to be a fighter. I'm going to bide my time and wait it out. They were very successful at the end. So, but, but it really was that the single most important thing is, is body weight. And then your, your opportunities within there are aggression. Your mm-hmm. temper. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to fight? And and then Randy, and especially working with our, our colleague and friend, uh, <clears throat> Ken G in, in Oklahoma, the Noble Foundation, where he had a large 3,000-acre uh, enclosure where he had years and years of, of known-aged animals and looking at uh, antler, su- antler size related to breeding success and and some other work that Randy did on the King Ranch uh, basically showed that the average successful breeder was average antler sized. Mm-hmm. You know, yep. if bigger antlers don't necessarily guarantee more breeding success. Right. Uh, D- despite, so typically right here, Steve, people will come back, but y'all did this study where you you controlled everything and put the, put the big artificial antlers on one buck and put the, the peewee antlers on another buck and the does showed. But th- those are really kind of two different questions. So with that study where we manipulated the antlers, first of all, and I think the most important thing is does were judging the extremes. 160 mm-hmm. inches of antler versus 80 inches of antler. Mm-hmm. And and did they show a preference for one or the other? Well, the way I look at it, and your two cents, Steve, I just think that the antlers were a signal to the doe that that is an older, mature buck. And so more often than not, she sidled up to him for a breeding opportunity. Um, but then in the wild, when it really comes down to the bucks then having to sort it out amongst themselves about who is dominant, that other things come into play there, like the aggression, like the body weight, etc. 
So they're going to sort out in their hierarchy who's number one, number two, number three. And antlers rarely fall into that on the buck side of the equation. And then when it comes time to breed, the doe is breeding the one that is available and the one that is taking charge at that moment. Did that clear and things some, up or make them more muddy? Well, I, and I'm going to throw in a little more confusion here too with some, you know, the, the cool thing about science and, and analytic analytical and uh, analyses and, and things we do, the more we look at, the more different uh, complexities we tease out. And, mm -hmm. you know, so another analysis that, that you and, and Phil Jones have, have led with us is looking at kind of an optimum size of, of antlers. And it appears that there's a, a, an optimum size of antler here in Mississippi. And I think it has to do with the uh, kind of an optimum you know, they want to have antlers as large as they need to have in order to to fight and to have a signal to the female that I'm, I'm okay. Uh, and, and when you think about that fighting, it's it's to me, it's a leveraging thing. So I think it was like 15 to 16 inch uh, inside spread and, and about a 20 to 22 inch main beam length, if I remember correctly. Yep, I remember specifically the beam length was 22 inches. 22 inches. Yep. So think about uh, a fighting stance and, and a wrestler. If a wrestler's, two wrestlers are, are going to face to face, they have their hands close in front of them. They don't have their hands out here trying to, you know, grab the other guy and do this. They're in here because from when you're in it and i'm not going to try to make a you know fighting stance here but uh, please don't oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there's an optimum leveraging that uh is best that there's an optimum leveraging i guess I, I won't get into the physics and all that about fulcrum length and all that thing those kind of things but there's an optimum well, size for fighting think about an nfl lineman a, a guard or a tackle they're, they don't have their, their arms spread completely out trying to utilize leverage with their arms, you know, all the way spread out. Their arms are in tight and in front of them, and that's where they, they have their yeah. power to try to move the other person around. So That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what two bucks that are fighting, they're trying to move the other guy, constantly twisting and turning them. And, and if you can turn your opponent, then you're, you're now in charge and in control. Yep. Yep. And that's, that's what's important. So yeah, what we, since you brought that analysis up, <clears throat> um, I think the way I have phrased it in the past, Steve, is that the data tell us that when you look at the relationship between a body weight and antler size, that for, um, say uh, up until about 20 inches or 22 inches, when body weight increases, antler size increases with it. So what that, when we look at that, it, it helps us think or we believe that there is, there is a correlation, a relationship that is advantageous in general to those bucks that once my body gets bigger, my antlers are going to scale with them. Mm -hmm. But then you reach a point to where um, you reach that sufficient size. So it would be the point of diminishing returns. And mm -hmm. so once you get to 23 or so inches, body weight continues to increase, but antler size, in this case, beam length, does not. And so they've kind of reached that, that is good enough. And investing more into antlers at this point is wasting energy. Mm -hmm. I should be putting that energy in my body weight because I want to live, number one, and that body weight and leverage like we're talking about is more important to get breeding opportunities than having two inch longer beams. It, it's not doing anything for you. And so now half of our, half of our listeners right now think, of, yeah, but well, so why are there such, such really big antlers? Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, yep. Yeah. Well, they're very rare. That's not, that's not the average. That's the right tail of the distribution. So that's, Three five three one percent of the bucks get those really really large antlers, and we're not comparing whether they were successful breeders or not. You just know that buck 
got to, to maturity and grew 170, 80, 190 inches of antlers, you have no idea how many fawns he sired over his lifetime. Mm -hmm. So I, I would wager a whole bunch of money that the average antler sized buck that may have been a little above average body weight probably sired more fawns over his life. And speaking of number of fawns sired, that was another of, of Andy, Randy's analyses, was looking at reproductive success. And he had some bucks, we, we had data from, you know, for eight or nine or ten years. And uh, so we really were able to look at breeding success of bucks and tie it back to their antler size. And it was surprising, at, you know, at that stage we were still learning a lot of new stuff, Uh and Randy kind of cl classified two different types of bucks, or at least th these are my ter my terms, not Randy's. Uh, but there's the the kind of the really uh, successful, short-term successful breeders that flash in the pan. Uh, they they bred and produced uh, for a year or two, and, and maybe bred, bred three or four does. Uh, successfully each year for two years and then they, they were gone and then there's another class of bucks that were uh, not very successful or very effective uh, but they they maybe bred one doe a year but they did it for six or seven years mm -hmm. and and uh, I call those the the good dancers they they uh, they weren't you know, a flash in the pan, boom, 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 breeding a bunch of does and being successful, but then they're gone. They kind of wore out, mm -hmm. gave, you know, killed because of all their enthusiasm or, or whatnot. But then there's the guy, the guys that kind of hang back and, and they're going to breed a doe every year, maybe, maybe occasionally too. And, but they're going to spread out that success over a longer time period. And so there's all these different patterns and to say, well, they're going to always do this or always do that. That's why we like to say, never say never and never say always. As soon as you say one thing that's always going to be driving a relationship, nope. Yeah, yep. So it's almost like a tortoise versus a hare strategy. Yep. The hare is that super aggressive. He's wide open and, and is successful for the short term, a year or two. But the tortoise maybe doesn't put forth that much effort. But who knows, maybe by not expending that much effort year in and year out, he lives longer mm -hmm. and has more breeding opportunities. So I guess two, two different strategies, at least two different strategies there that bucks can use to, mm -hmm. to sire fawns over their life. And maybe, one thing, one... I need to wrap up uh, this question with Chuck here. Chuck, this was good, man. You got us talking. But, but I yeah. think looking at the very end of it, is uh, he may be going towards, um, if you have what appears to be this super dominant buck, but he mm -hmm. has little antlers, you know, uh, sh should you harvest him? Um, Chuck uses the, the terminology, could, could, should you call him out? And is, is another mature buck going to then fill in after that? And so, ag again, we'll get back to our, what, what is your purpose of culling? Um, if, if you're quote culling him thinking you're going to make some type of genetic improvement by doing that, you're not, but if you're trying to create a void there for another buck, then by removing this four or five year old buck that has an eight pointer and a short tined and has below average antler size, I would say, go ahead and shoot him and make sausage out of him. And you are going to create, yes, you're going to create space for another buck to occupy that area now is it going to be above average antlers average below average who knows there's no predicting that no and and i don't think he's there's going to be just like this huge space that some buck from a mile away is just going to come come in and hey i'm going to fill this spot now it's it's bucks that are kind of mm -hmm. familiar with that space yeah and you take one out well you're going to see another rise to the top there in terms of the dominant structure but um uh, yeah oh, there's so many things we could talk about but I, i'm gonna take your lead and and yeah see, see how nice bronson is he didn't say steve stop talking 
He just said, we need to wrap this up. I almost used my little Led Zeppelin line with you. Ramble on. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was Dream On. Or, no, that's another band. Dream yeah, On. Yeah, that's another band. Yeah, you know, and I'm not, I'm not going to start. Please don't. Arrowsmith Please don't here. sing. Yeah. Um, All right, Jim Benton. Do you want to go with that question? Yeah, uh, I'll ask that and, and uh, let you answer it. How about so, Jim? Uh, how does exotic flora density? And um, I'm thinking uh, so exotic plants in, in the environment. How does that the amount of exotic, you know? competitive exotic plants in your environment affect deer and coyote relationships and behavior and each uh, species respective populations steve much like jerry clower in the story he tells this question is so simple and obvious i'm gonna let you answer it <laughs> it's like jerry clower letting his chauffeur answer the question that time um <laughs> So, yeah, I think the question is essentially if, if you have uh, at, at what level does exotic invasive vegetation uh, going to affect your deer population? Um, specifically, ask about deer and coyote relationship behavior. I have no idea regarding the interplay between deer and coyotes. I have no idea. So in, in that regard, Steve, I'll let you chime in. I would just say in general, though, that it's I hate to say it but it, it depends it's going to depend on uh, the extent of the vegetation on your property or in your area some exotic vegetation may not be that harmful to deer habitat other others can be catastrophic to deer habitat so if you're on the gulf coast for example think about kogon grass if kogon grass takes over a majority of the understory of your forest, you're in deep, deep, deep trouble. You're in deep trouble. But, you know, there's always going to be some exotic vegetation species wherever you are at in North America. There are some exotics there. So I guess I would just qualify my answer with it's going to depend on the extent of the colonization what proportion of the habitat is is made up by this exotic vegetation and how harmful it is if mm -hmm. it's not providing any food or any cover for deer then that's going to be really bad mm -hmm. yeah, and i think the key I, I have three i guess three points to make here one is you've touched on if if it's really a dominant species of vegetation on your property excluding other species which that's in, invasive species tend to be aggressive and exclude other things and, and we talk a lot about building habitat and if you build the right kind of habitat which is generally going to be a diverse habitat you're going to meet the needs nutritionally and cover of your deer population so an invasive species comes in and dominates the vegetation community you have change the diversity from high to low and that's not a good thing it's going to typically drive down the nutritional intake of the population because you've gone to do, uh, you know fewer species and so the deer aren't able to find what they need when they need it and a single species like you know, kogon grass you're talking about it, which is a very low uh, doesn't provide much cover at all and it provides no nutrition so you, you've got a double whammy in that case you, no no cover and no nutrition so you've got a you're hosed <laughs> uh, scientific <laughs> term there you're hosed. Yeah, you're you're hosed uh, so I, I think the bottom line is back to you know i agree 100 percent with what you're saying it depends on the extent and some exotic vegetation species can provide reasonable nutrition some can provide cover but if it's all one thing that's never a good thing mm -hmm. and so some might say so how can you have you know an exotic species all over the landscape and it, and it be bad how can that be good well i think of uh an example and i'm not saying this is good necessarily but i 
do not think it has diminished deer populations whatsoever is look at Japanese honeysuckle in the southeast. That mm-hmm. pro- provides a tremendous amount of forage. I, I don't think it's the most preferred by any chance, but it is a reliable browse mm-hmm. that is all throughout the southeastern landscape that deer use. So yeah. that just kind of, when we were talking about Kogon grass versus something like Japanese honeysuckle, one of them, not so bad. You might even, I hate to say good, <laughs> uh, you know, I wish it weren't here, but mm-hmm. it is here and deer can benefit from it. But Kogon grass is just, and, and there's a lot of examples like that, but that's not good. And the more you have of, of that on your property, the worse your, your deer population is going to be. Yeah, and part you know part of the the prevalence and dominance of an exotic species, a lot of times we can't do anything about it and fix it, but some of it is an historical effect of of land management decisions as well. You know, kogon grasses spread probably up and down our highways when uh, seeds or seed heads are stuck to heavy equipment that's moved worked on a property and there's some kogon grass there and get the seeds in the treads and they drive it down the highway and the seeds fall off and you end up with you know highway distribute distribution uh, corridors of of plants developing along the highway and then seeds are further distributed down the road and a lot of stuff going on there a lot of different moving parts but it comes down to nutritional effects cover and the dominance of that species and uh, if you've got a bad impact from dominance poor nutrition and inadequate cover then yeah jim you've got a lot of negative effects there the deer aren't going to be able to produce the number of fawns the fawns that are produced are going to be more susceptible to coyote predation because of lack of fawning escape cover hiding cover and escape cover so you're going to have problems with your deer coyote relationships but a a well-managed population level uh, habitat in my mind isn't going to have a coyote problem if you have a coyote problem you have something else that's driving or allowing those coyotes to be a problem steve we got to kick it into high gear here You've got a a hard break coming up, I know. Um, So let's jump. Let me me point out, uh, because I think you asked that one, so I'm going to ask from Wade. Hey, professors, I'd like to see a podcast dealing with the issues of heat stress and poor quality soils here in the lower coastal plain. And he owns some land in southeast Alabama and is dealing with with the heat and... uh, naturally low quality soils and historically that have uh, currently land use changes over the last 30 50 60 years of you know you have a really a high prevalence of low quality uh, forages plants growing on that landscape mm-hmm. that's oh so you're you're posing the question to me <laughs> yes uh, i am i'm, I'm uh, wade's question so what about a podcast dealing with this uh and we have a, a colleague former graduate msu deer lab student who just wrapped up a dissertation looking at heat stress mm-hmm. and choices that deer make uh, maybe we could get uh, jacob dykes to come on with us sometime I'm sure he would be happy to. Yeah. But so there's kind of two parts to this question. We are talking about heat stress and this is one thing, Steve, we have seen over the years with our Mississippi data is um, I, and I believe you and and others with MDWFMP uh, thought we would see a really strong signal in the data from drought is that when body weights were down in the fall, it's the way automatic. Well, it's got to be because of that drought that was in October, or excuse me, in, in August or September. And, um, and when we started looking at the data in like 30 years worth of data, year after year, looking at those body weights in the fall, what are the conditions during the summer? And the, the strongest signal year in, year out was heat. It wasn't the amount of rain. Now, there's a correlation there because a lot of times mm-hmm. when you have 
long bouts of heat, you didn't have rain, but there are exceptions. But what we saw more often was the heat, and that really corresponds with, uh, with livestock and, and just observations in general, could be in deer pens or whatever, is that when animals get really hot, they really don't want to move as much, they don't want to eat as much, and so they're going to go and find cover where they can hopefully, relatively speaking, thermoregulate and mm-hmm. stay out of the hot sun. And that's kind of what Jacob was doing with looking at brush management in South Texas. And one of the things he's going to educate all of us about is that in, in that area of the country, all brush is not equal. And so there, there are some configurations of brush that are more optimal for thermoregulation and can air move through it you know can can deer cool down and so that's i guess the biggest deal i would say on the heat stress part is that we believe at least at the msu deer lab we believe yes it's real and the way i would try to combat that is just making sure with my habitat management i I have areas where and this is generally not a not a problem because in the southeast we grow trees and trees cast shade but just making sure you have areas where um, that that deer can can be in the shade and that where wind can move through the stand to, to cool their body and mm-hmm. we need to do a little more research on that now as for poor quality soils yeah you know that can be a little bit tricky because we tend to just blame the soil for everything It's bad soil, therefore it's bad deer. But what is missing in there is the vehicle that gets nutrients in deer. And that vehicle is plants. And so if you're in the South Mississippi, South Alabama, and forest is probably going to be, but probably pine forest is going to be the primary land use, it, it really all depends on how that forest is managed is going to affect how much food is produced in that forest, which is going to affect deer quality on your property. So Steve, you and I have shown a graphic for my dissertation many, many, many years ago where we correlated the proportion of the property that was in closed canopy pine forests. Now, it's not just that it's pine, it's that it's closed canopy pine forest. And I remember just that beautiful regression, that collection of points followed a line. The more you increase the proportion of your property in closed canopy pine forest, antler size went down, down, down. It corresponded with it perfectly. Has nothing to do with the pine tree it has everything to do with sunlight. So the way the pines are managed in that system for the purpose, that purpose of generating income from pine trees, from the pine forest, the, con- the unfortunate consequence of that is that those tree canopies are capturing all of the light. No sun is reaching the forest floor, meaning there are no plants for deer. Along with that, there can also be some potentially some challenges because of the soil. And mm-hmm. so it, it's, it's a more complicated story than just saying, I have poor soil, therefore deer quality is going to be low. You, you have to factor into the equation, do deer have plants that they can eat? And if you have, so um, I, I guess I'll toss it to you Steve I'll wrap up with this I would rather manage a property that had poor quote air quote here you know poor soils where I could manage the herbaceous community than a property that was in quote good soils where sunlight is not hitting the ground and Mm -hmm. I can't grow deer plants I think I'm going to win as a manager in poor soils where I can manage for Forbes and manage for the herbaceous uh, community and use fire, et cetera. I think I'm going to win. Yeah, I agree with that 100%, Bronson. And and we've shown with a good bit of our work down in the lower coastal plain with mid-rotation management 
and and yeah these more pines you have more of the problem kind of a, an inherent problem uh, with that closed canopy but when you thin the pines if you manage them effectively using traditional timber stand improvement methods including fire <clears throat> but also once you thin if you can control that low quality brush that is prevalent in that lower coastal plain underneath the pine tree so if you thin the pine trees and you still have a, a heavy mid-story of low quality brows that's still not going to help because the brows was there before the trees were thinned and they're going to be there before uh, after the trees are thinned and there's still no good quality forage so it comes back to those plants that you were talking about and it, sometimes we have to use some, some selective herbicides to remove the undesirable plants and and you know a lot of hunters and landowners think well i don't want to kill plants i want to grow plants but you got to use a selective herbicide and the right timing of fire in combination to customize and, and produce the habitat quality and the that diversity that we talk so much about plant diversity so that the deer can find the forages that they want and you get rid of the low quality brows and make room for sunlight to reach lower and and with the promotion of, of fire and, and scarification of the seeds and getting rid of the the duff layer of the pine pine needles you open up a lot of growing space for high quality forbs all right so uh i guess so what i, I try to teach our forestry students when when they're in my classroom is you know pines are not necessarily a great thing in some situations but just because you have pines if you can manage those pines i, I jump in with your you know i'd rather have a bunch of pine trees growing on my land that i can then manage effectively as opposed to some closed canopy hardwoods that i can't do anything with because there's no market for the hardwoods to be harvested and and i can't do anything with it yeah yeah i, I think i had a couple incomplete thoughts in retrospect there i i, I kept talking about just the, the pine trees it has nothing to do with whether it's a pine or a hardwood it, it's a property of the canopy is closed Yes. So, so to a deer, it does not matter if it's a, a pine tree, a sweet gum, or, or an oak tree, for that matter. You mm -hmm. get the benefit of some mass with the oak tree, but the bottom line is, whatever the tree canopy is, if it's closed and intercepting all the light, you are across the board in, in bad shape. Yeah. yeah. You know what, buddy? Um, we haven't even gotten through page one of about oh. 15 pages of questions we're doomed we're doomed <laughs> but, yeah i guess the the good news here is that we'll have a lot more podcasts from based on these series of questions yeah yeah all right let's uh let's make a push here to get through these last four or five questions here so steve this is from brian peterson and it is regarding i believe he is in nebraska and it is about uh, velvet casting time frames and what are going to be the triggers for velvet shedding. So we talked earlier about the rut. How about um, what are the triggers for velvet shedding? And do you have any observations maybe in the past, Steve? And maybe you remember the memorable observations <laughs> uh, from individual bucks that have helped you form an opinion here on on their timing and the repeatability of, of velvet shedding. Yeah, I, I have had some memorable examples of, of bucks that uh, they shed their velvet the same time year in, year out. And uh, I think there's less going on in terms of fewer moving parts with bucks and, and their velvet shedding because they don't have this big, huge thing called uh, gestation and, and lactation associated with the does. And I think I'm going to be, maybe will prove me wrong here, but I think I'm going to say that uh, velvet shedding is, is more consistent from year to year than a breeding date would be. 
for an individual deer and that the the population is still going to be pretty darn consistent at the population level large numbers that they're going to be shedding their velvet the peak of velvet shedding is going to be the same year in year out sounds like something we could test though yes we need to take a closer look yes and and so maybe we'll do some additional analyses i know we've we've talked about how we could do a couple of different approaches to that and maybe we'll follow up and and have somebody working on that yep i think that's a good idea so uh you know so back to the kind of the overall controlling thing and, and a lot of people have heard about photo period and, and photo period is just the the ratio of of light to dark and and you know short days long nights long days short nights you know being you know short days long nights during the winter time and, and summertime is long days shorter nights and that that transition into uh shorter days and longer nights and that that relative ratio of those is what we refer to as changes in photo period that kind of help time patterns of physiological processes in wildlife mm -hmm. and so those are they, they set the parameters and then within those parameters nutritional condition of of individuals can affect how their expression uh, falls out in a given year but um I think within a population of bucks, their pattern is going to be much less variable than a doe. Uh, still controlled generally by photo period, but because there's not as much to get in the way of a buck's nutritional condition uh, like there is for the doe, uh, I think those bucks are going to be more consistent from year to year. So do we um, want to jump into to Mike? Uh, Talking yeah. about the deer rutting at the end of November, and he doesn't give a, a location here, but uh, given the time frame, uh, when would you say fawns are fully on their feet and following mom versus hiding alone? And uh, Mike likes to drive a tractor and, and does things on his tractor, and he's, he's worried about making sure he doesn't run over or detrimentally disturb fawns. He want, but he wants to get his tractor work done well in advance of hunting season. So how long should he wait after peak fawning time before he gets on his tractor? Because he doesn't want to run over you know, his young fawns. They're in a hiding behavior. They're not going to jump up and run away for the certain amount of time after birth. What do you think? What do you think there? Well, we're going to have so peak breeding there end of end of November. So we're, we're going to have to just make some assumptions here with some very easy math. So let, let's just say that the breeding is completed by November, but very, very little breeding in December. If we then look at the gestation, that is right at seven months. And so that means fawn should be on the ground in June. And... And again, there's going to be a window. That's a population average. Some are born a little bit earlier. Some are a little bit later. And then uh, after those fawns are born, I'm thinking, Steve, you need to give them at least three weeks to a month before they can really start responding to a, a stimulus like a person or a tractor or whatever where a fawn is going to be able to get up and run. So you may really want to hold off on doing any bush hogging. Uh, you probably want to wait until August. Okay. So you got June is when fawns are on the ground. Let's give them all of July, and then let's do our mowing in, in August. What do you think? I, I would I would agree with that. I think you know several weeks of hiding behavior and. Uh, I think I've rambled, got rambling in the past about talking about uh, how neonate fawns actually turn off their heart rate and and their breathing rate in response to predator stimulus, and and that's a really cool phenomenon. That's the extreme hiding phase when they're just a few days up to a week old. You literally can't jump them out of your 
their hiding spot. They're going to stay, and if a tractor's coming, they're going to run that baby over, and, and nothing you can do about it. And and they get further and further developed, and that hiding behavior becomes less restrictive because their muscles are developing, and they're able to avoid the tractor or, or whatever, uh, certainly by a month. And if you give them another month just to make sure that they're uh, going to be out of the way and following mom, I think, yeah, two months, they're going to be with mom and, and not a concern at all. Okay. Let's go to, I don't have a name here, but it's uh, Greenway 27. I've noticed in southwest Georgia that the overwhelming majority of our bucks make substantial antler increases until three and a half. After three and a half, I typically see very small increases. For example, only about five inches increase year after year. Been uh, fortunate enough to hunt on the property where the bucks can live a long time. Um, maybe it's the TV shows, but I feel like Midwest bucks make huge antler size increases after three and a half years old. You want to start with that one or do you want me to jump in? Well, we can talk about a lot of data that's been collected by us and also our colleagues in, in South Texas and looking at uh, growth rates of bucks based on known age bucks and repeated data and following same bucks year in, year out, looking at these rates of growth. And I think six years of age is, is going to be the sweet spot for peak antler development. And by three years of age, just looking at averages, uh, I think you're around 65 to 70 percent of your maximum antler size by three years of age. So you still have a pretty good chunk. You know, say you're at 70 percent, you still have another 30 percent to grow. Mm -hmm. And now, so but the rate of increase per year is starting to decrease dramatically because it's going to be another three years before you're maxed out. So you, you get 70% of your growth in three years and then 30% of your growth the next three years. So the annual increment is going to be smaller for the next three years. But if you're a real connoisseur of, of antlers, uh, it's not just the size, it's the characteristics. And, and, you know, those older bucks are going to really start doing some interesting things. So maybe the antlers aren't quite adding on that incremental increase a proportional increase isn't there but you come up with some pretty interesting things at six and seven years of age oh yeah mass splits stickers drops all those little things that make antlers interesting that that magic is tip typically happening after five years of age so mm -hmm. yeah i guess i'll just jump in and, and add in steve i uh Com completely agree. That's exactly what our data show was that the, I, would, I guess I would call it the rate of increase is a lot steeper. They, yeah, they really are uh, at accelerated growth until about three and a half. And then from three to four and four to five, et cetera, um, it's, it's more shallow. The gain they're making from year to year is less and less at that point. But one, one little interesting dynamic we have here in Mississippi, just because we have a, a, an ag region and then, uh, well, from the previous question, when you go to our southern part of the state, uh, that's mainly uh, forest management in, in that area, southern Mississippi, is that the, the rate of growth is a lot steeper in our delta region. So it's mm -hmm. like... They, they get to maximum antler size sooner than we see in the southern part of the state. So in our Delta region, they're at like 95 plus percent of their maximum by four and a half in the Delta. But when you get down into the lower coastal plain area, it is, uh, it is basically just a linear growth pattern. Not, not this curved with diminishing returns. It's like this linear growth pattern until six or seven. Mm -hmm. So just less food is available and they just grow at a, at a lesser rate um, in, in how they get there. Yeah. And I guess I'll, I'll refer to uh, my uh, admission 
uh, earlier about being misperceived based on a few samples here and there. Sometimes I, I miss, uh, misconstrue, and, and we we're talking, I think it was Stryker earlier about things that he had seen maybe needed more sample size. And, and I think uh, Greenway 27, I'd say, you know, I don't believe everything you see in TV, on, TV, on a TV show. Uh, and, um, you know, they're, they're going to show you a very small number of animals. And, and they may say that the deer is this the year old, and, and they don't usually know just how old the deer is. If they do, then it's in a highly controlled situation and um, maybe not representative of what would be happening in the wild. Uh, I'm not poo-pooing deer hunting shows. I'm just saying don't necessarily believe everything you see on a hunting show and, and generalize from what you see. Well, let, let, let's let's phrase it uh, like this, because this is really what I think is going on, um, is that th that's an exceptional buck. And, and so a lot of the lingo, Steve, might be, you know, we, we've had this buck on film for several years, and then he, quote, blew up this year, added 20 inches of antler, you know, from four to five or something like that. Well, again, just looping it back to what you just said, yeah, I have no doubt that individual buck did that. Well, heck, you've, you've got photographic evidence showing that that buck did that, but that's not the population average. That mm -hmm. That's an instance. That's an individual. And that individual was obviously very special. You know how I know that? Because he made it on TV. Yeah. <laughs> that's why he was special. So we don't have all those other three, four, and five-year-old bucks that followed the normal pattern because nothing was really special about him to, to make it on a TV show. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question is from Tim, Tim Connor. Um, scouting today, and I was wondering why old rubs are, well, old rubs. Do bucks tend to rub on different trees each year? I've never really observed that they hit the same trees year after year. Well, I, think, I haven't either. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen some trees uh, that have evidence of year after year after year rubbing behavior. And I've had some landowners say, yeah, that tree right there has been a rub on that tree for years. Mm -hmm. So th I think they do keep coming back to certain trees, but there's also always new, new trees that uh, are going to be rubbed on in a given year. And they may not become the fa one of the favorite trees. They may just grow out of being used. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I don't know. And I've seen uh, some of those. I mean, that, that's not the norm by, by any stretch, but I, I have seen a couple of those in person as well. It's usually a, a bigger diameter tree as well. It's never on a little sapling or, or seedling it's a bigger diameter tree and i think steve a lot of it might just be based on its position where it's located it might just be that it's in a real prominent travel corridor and the rub is just serving as a signpost like we talked about earlier mm -hmm. and it's just going to be one of it's, it's deer graffiti and so deer other deer are going to walk by it notice it it's in the ideal location they're going to rub on it as well and because it's an older, larger diameter tree, um, you can the tree lives from year to year, and you see the scarring on it from, from year to year. Um, how often that occurs, how frequently this occurs, I honestly have no idea. But I certainly know it does occur. I, I would guess just generally that there's going to be a bunch of trees used just for a year or two. And, and then they're not going to be used again right? because there's thousands, you know, some properties have hundreds or thousands of trees per acre and, you know, they're not going to be rubbing on every single tree. Mm -hmm. They might change one tree to another from year to year. And right. again, it's just like, what are you seeing? And are you remembering the uniqueness or are you remembering the average? And we tend to remember the memorable things. Mm-hmm. All right, Steve, well, this is our last question. One qu one last question from Bryce, and this is one last question under the biology and behavior. We still have a 
buck movement we've got a whole list of questions but the last one for today is from bryce sharp when someone says peak rut what are they actually referring to buck searching or actual breeding time and and boy that's a great question to end on Mm -hmm. you want to take a whack at it first yeah I, i i have actually asked that clarifying question to people before is is I'll follow up with well what exactly are you referring to are you referring to buck behavior buck observations while hunting or are you asking is the peak of the rut when the most does are conceived um, we I think Steve the way we kind of parse it up is we call the peak of the rut peak of conception when yeah. the breedings are taking place but we fully acknowledge, you know, from a, a buck movement standpoint and in terms of what we're probably going to see with the scrape study we're working on and certainly from hunters, what they're seeing um, when they are detecting, meaning hunters here, when they are detecting peak observations is probably the pre-rut, the, the week or two before peak breeding is is likely what they're thinking is the peak of the rut but mm-hmm. peak conceptions are probably one to two weeks after peak observations yeah that early rut there's a lot of excitement in the air and a lot of signpost activity and but not a lot of breeding but once the breeding's taking place they're not they're not rubbing rubbing trees and, and making scrapes so much they're chasing does yeah so the the, the pre-rut bucks are searching that's why you're seeing them. They're covering ground. They're looking for the the earliest does coming into estrus. But when you get into the peak, that is when they've located those does mm-hmm. and the courtship behavior. And they're sticking with them for six hours, 12 hours, you know, 24 hours, um, forming that tending bond. And that's generally when you don't see as many bucks while you're hunting is during the Speaking peak of, of bonds. Yeah, that might let's let's wrap up with the bond concept. We we are bonded, and we really appreciate the bond between our information sharing and our listeners. And we've we've had some great questions today, uh, and we really appreciate everyone, uh, Stryker and Matt and Tim and Chuck and and uh, Brian and and others uh, that have sent us some questions, some great questions. Got Those us rambling a little more than maybe we needed to, but or at least I d- probably did. Um, well, Steve, by now they, they know that's what they signed up for. We tend, we tend to ramble and by we, I mean you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, I had to have one last little jab in there. That, that's, that's good. That's a good place to be. <laughs> yep. Okay. Steve, thanks a bunch. I had a lot of fun and this is the first of several of these to come. So we'll have a, have uh, another two or maybe three episodes answering these questions so thanks to you and thanks for thanks to everyone that wrote in we appreciate it take care and good scouting good hunting coming up we thank the patrick f taylor foundation and the saint john and dudley hutchinson families for their endowed financial support of our efforts we also thank our employers the mississippi state university extension service and the forest and wildlife research center If you have questions or suggestions, please log on to msudeerlab.com and click on the Deer University tab. 